Well, welcome everybody. Um, good afternoon and thanks for joining us this afternoon. Um, as we know, these are historic times for sure, um, as we face this unprecedented uh, public health challenge and we've been doing things very differently. Um, and today we're making history yet again when Dr. Schiffman joins us in, make, in um, uh, delivering the first Dean's Lecture um, virtually. So we thank him for his willingness to do this for us. But whether face-to-face -face or virtual, this is a very, very special occasion as we all have the opportunity to learn from um, more about the work of our newly appointed and promoted professors and very importantly, celebrate their successes. Achieving the appointment of professor represents an incredible accomplishment by our senior faculty and confirms not only the respect and the high regard of the school, but also of colleagues across the nation and throughout the world. Today, it is my particular pleasure to um, introduce uh, Dr. Jeremy Schiffman. And um, uh, Dr. Schiffman joined Johns Hopkins uh, back in 2018 as a Bloomberg Distinguished Professor of Global Health Policy. Um, and he has appointments in both international health at the school, here at the school, but also at the School of Advanced International Studies. He's a political scientist by training. Uh, his research focuses on the politics of health policy making in low and middle income countries and in global governance. His research has been funded by the Gates Foundation, by MacArthur, Rockefeller Oak, and uh, the Open Societies Foundations, among many other organizations. His work regularly appears in multiple journals, including The Lancet, as well as the American Journal of Public Health. Dr. Schiffman received the Gary and Stacy Jacobs Award for Excellence in, public, in Health Policy Research back in 2012. He has, served, he has served on multiple technical advisor committees for organizations working in global health and is on the editorial board of several health policy journals. And across his career, he has received six awards for excellence in teaching. And I'm very proud to say that next week, uh, he will receive his seventh, if I'm, if I'm keeping count correctly, uh, because he will be receiving uh, this year's Golden Apple Award for a medium-sized class. And I will say, having been on the faculty only since 2018, this is uh, quite an accomplishment. So congratulations on that. Prior to coming to Johns Hopkins, he was on the faculty of Syracuse University's Maxwell School of Citizenship and Public Affairs and the American University School of Public Affairs, where he was named Scholar Teacher of the Year back in 2017. He received a BA summa cum laude from uh, Yale University in philosophy, an MA from our own uh, School of Advanced International Studies here at Johns Hopkins in international relations, as well as a PhD from the University of Michigan in political science. Now, before I turn it over, um, uh, uh, I. To, to Jeremy, I would also like to introduce his co uh, colleague, Dr. Yusra Shawar, who's an assistant scientist in international health. She is working with Dr. Schiffman on the paper that will form the basis of today's lecture, and Dr. Shawar will uh, facilitate the Q&A session following the talk. But it is now my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Jeremy Schiffman uh, as um, uh, a Bloomberg Distinguished Professor and Professor here at the School of Public Health. Uh, Jeremy. Thank you very much, Dean McKenzie, for that kind introduction and also for the invitation to deliver this Dean's Lecture. I'm going to share my screen now so people can follow along. I presume it's up now? It is. Great. So again, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I've now been at Johns Hopkins for 20 months and it's really been a privilege to be on the faculty here at the Bloomberg School of Public Health in the Department of International Health, as well as at SAIS. And it's really uh, a remarkable chance to interact with a, an amazing community of faculty and students. It's been such a privilege. Well, I'd like to speak to you about the question of how issues emerge as global health priorities, considering COVID-19 in comparative perspective. And I do not claim to have an answer to this very complex question. I rather see this as an ongoing research agenda 
but I hope you'll find that the ideas we offer are useful for addressing this research agenda. I'll speak for just under 30 minutes, which will leave about 10 minutes at the end for questions. And um, as Dean McKenzie indicated, my colleague, Dr. Yusra Shawa, will be monitoring the question and answer function during the talk. She uh, is, again, an assistant scientist in the Department of International Health. She's an expert on global health policymaking. She and I collaborate closely on many projects, including the one I'm speaking on today. And when I'm finished speaking, she'll convey to me um, three or four questions that you've posed. I, un I undoubtedly, there won't be enough time to answer all of them. So those that don't get answered, please feel free to email me at the email address on the slide here and we'll try to respond to your questions. So um, it seems impossible to address the question of how issues emerge as global health priorities without considering COVID-19 and the widespread concern over that has emerged. Quite appropriately, it's receiving massive amounts of attention now given its severity. And that attention has emerged quite quickly uh, with more than a, a quarter million deaths reported to date and massive economic disruption. But even as we think about COVID-19, I think it's important to note that there are many other global health issues that lead to numerous deaths and potentially great economic disruption and receive remarkably little attention and very few resources. Just to give an example, antimicrobial resistance, which experts estimate cause about 700 deaths annually, a figure they note could rise to 10 million per year if urgent action is not taken. So what explains attention and neglect to global health issues? I'd like to consider this question in four parts. First is to convey why I think this is a hugely important question to ask and offer five reasons for that. I'll then offer a framework we've developed consisting of three categories of factors that potentially are helpful in thinking about how attention emerges to global health issues. We'll then make uh, a descriptive observation that we seem to observe three broad patterns by which issues come to receive attention in global health, which we, we are calling the imminent threat path, social movement path, and scientific initiative path. And we'll connect the framework factors to these paths. And then finally, I'll conclude by uh, speaking to some priorities for advancing research and practice. So first of all, what do we mean by priority for a global health issue? Well, it means that global and national leaders are providing attention and resources to a problem commensurate with that problem's severity. Now, of course, it doesn't guarantee pop population health impact, but it helps to facilitate action. Why is it an important question to ask how issues emerge as global health priorities? I want to offer five reasons. There are at least five good reasons to be thinking about this. And let me speak to each one of these five reasons in turn. First is that the global health agenda is in continuous flux. And we really need to understand the drivers of change. Second, I've noticed that this question sparks a lot of speculation, but actually remarkably little research. I have observed many uh, hypotheses being floated about, which aren't wrong, but they oversimplify reality. Some of the most common propositions I hear are first, that it's all about big people and the institutions they lead and the resources they provide. But the problem with this proposition is that it begs the question how these individuals come to determine their priorities in the first place. And secondly, it likely overestimates their power and agency and underestimates the power of broader structural forces that no single individual or organization can control. A second proposition that I hear thrown about is that it's all about the latest crisis. But crises are contextual. 
and they depend on where they occur. For instance, crises that occur in low-income settings often with very severe impact receive very few global resources despite that impact. So it depends where, in what form, what nature of, is the crisis. A third proposition that often gets raised is then, well, is it all about the fears of rich countries and their interests? And yet, when I think about certain issues such as maternal survival, maternal death and childbirth, with which thankfully now in many uh, national settings, as well as globally, is receiving considerably greater resources than it used to, when I think about that kind of issue, I have trouble explaining that in terms of the fears of rich countries, because maternal death and childbirth in low-income countries, while a tragedy, is not a threat to rich countries. A final hypothesis I hear is that it's basically random and there's little we can say about it. Well, before we go there, I think it's worth considering the possibility that there may be systematic factors that account, at least in part, for how we see the global health agenda as set. Another reason to address this question is that research shows quite conclusively that so-called rational factors such as the burden of disease and the cost effect, the existence of cost-effective interventions are inadequate to explain the variance in the tension we see across global health issues. Yet another important reason to attend to this is it, it appears to be the case that both ideas in the form of analysis of causality and interventions, as well as normative ideas about moral claims to what needs to be done, ideas on the one hand, as on, and power and interests, personal agendas, institutional and governmental agendas, all seem to shape global health agenda setting but we don't quite know how, and we need to understand their interactions. Finally, few observers of global health agenda setting are very happy with how the process unfolds. There are many deficiencies that need to be surmounted, and I'll turn to these in the, in the end. One is that there's a democratic deficit. That is, institutions in high-income countries and their leaders often are setting priorities in global health for the world, and the voice of those most affected in low-income settings is har hardly heard. A second problem, and we've seen this markedly in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, is a denigration of expertise that needs to be respected, where some individuals claim they know what is to be done but do not, and other individuals who do know what to do are not listened to. And finally, the observation that given the unfortunate reality of scarce resources, there's competition in the global health space for resources by issues and advocacy groups to attract these resources with the unfortunate result that certain issues get crowded out. For instance, non-communicable diseases, which pose huge burden globally, but receive very little, very few resources. So ha having spoken to the issue of why we should care about this problem, let me now turn to a framework we've developed to hopefully, that hopefully advances thinking about how we should uh, analyze the problem. We've developed a framework of three broad categories of factors that potentially shape how agendas are set in global health. And let me speak to each of these categories of factors in turn, what we mean by them and what may be some of the most powerful elements. First is the issue characteristics, the features of the problem itself. Other things being equal, research indicates that certain features will increase the likelihood a problem receives attention. For instance, severity in terms of economic and social impact, mortality and morbidity. Tractability, is this understood to be a problem that can be solved? Lethality and transmissibility, is there a high case fatality rate? Is it spreading quickly? And very importantly, who's affected? What population group? If it's a privileged, more elite population group, 
with greater power, the issue is more likely to gain attention than ones that affect marginalized or vulnerable populations. A second broad category of factors pertain to human agency, namely the strength and the strategies of the actors involved. Here, certain factors seem to rise and be influential, including the quality of leadership, national, global, civil society leadership in advancing attention to the issue. The quality of governance institutions that can organize collective action. The composition of the networks that seek to address the issue, for instance, is a network a very homogeneous network comprised solely of scientists from northern countries or is the network the coalition that seeks to address an issue heterogeneous including those scientists from southern countries northern countries advocates un officials civil society actors and so forth and it's important to pay attention to the composition of these networks because sociologists show quite clearly that heterogeneous networks and groups are better decision-making entities than homogeneous ones. Another question to ask about involved actors is the nature of opposition. Some issues, for instance, tobacco control, incite significant opposition, for instance, by the tobacco industry. Others incite less, uh, a lesser degree of opposition, for instance, newborn survival, which I will talk about. And finally, framing strategies. What strategies are actors using to publicly position the issue? And this speaks to the fact that any given issue can be framed in multiple ways. And only some re resonate with political elites and other actors whose resources are needed. Just consider the history of AIDS, for instance, initially understood as an issue that affects only certain marginalized populations, but over time, reframed as a security issue, a humanitarian issue, a rights issue, an existential threat to humanity. And while not the only factor by any means that shaped the rise of global and national attention to AIDS, that was one factor. I want to make uh, an additional set of comments about human agency. In thinking about the power of human agency, I've been particularly drawn to a theory of the policy process called punctuated equilibrium, which was developed by Frank Baumgartner and Brian Jones. I think this theory has great promise for making sense of patterns of attention to issues in global health. Two concepts from that theory are particularly relevant. One is called the policy image and the second, the policy monopoly. So what is a policy image? It's the dominant way in which a problem is understood, perceived, especially by political elites. And it can encompass such matters as the beliefs about the problem's boundaries, its causes, its solutions, and its perceived importance. So for instance, consider the evolution of ideas about tobacco and the present relevance of these ideas to battles over vaping. The tobacco industry historically has framed tobacco as a matter of individual choice and freedom. This image, thankfully, was successfully challenged by tobacco control advocates who emphasized nicotine's addictive properties, how tobacco harms health, and the manipulative marketing techniques of the tobacco industry. So besides policy image, the second core idea from this theory is that of a policy monopoly. And this refers to the set of actors that have acquired the power to control the policy image. These actors link powerful industries, governments, international organizations, large foundations, civil society movements. They can link multiple kinds of actors. Policy monopolies with the power to control the policy image may persist over long periods of time. And that explains why there's maybe stability in particular global health policy priorities across time. But policy monopolies are never everlasting. Inevitably, new actors come to the fore and challenge their control, bringing forth new policy images and potentially shifting agendas suddenly and decisively, as happened with tobacco control. And if these actors succeed, then they 
may come to constitute new policy monopolies that are able to sustain their own policy images over extended periods of time. So these concepts really raise deeper questions pertaining to global health agenda setting, including how do policy monopolies form? How do they acquire the power to shape policy images? How and under what circumstances do challenges emerge? Under what circumstances do these challenges succeed? And how do objective changes in the world, such as the emergence and spread of new diseases, interact with policy images and policy monopolies to change agenda setting? So I've spoken with about two of the three categories of our framework, issue characteristics, human agency. The third category are structural forces. These are forces much larger than any individual that constrict and facilitate human agency. For instance, one example is the phenomenon of economic and cultural globalization, which facilitates the rapid spread of pathogens. On the other hand, it has positive effects too. It permits the formation of global networks that can fight these pathogens. Another example of a structural force are widely shared social beliefs, social norms on gender, for instance, that harm women and men. And yet there are also positive social norms. For instance, ones surrounding human dignity that spur us to act to protect population groups at risk. So having talked about why we should consider this question and a framework of factors for thinking about the question, I want to now talk about a more descriptive concern. And that is an observation that if we look across the universe of global health issues that have come to receive atten attention, they may be classified into three broad types. I want to emphasize none of these are pure and they all share features of one another. But there, there are some defining types and we call these imminent threat social movement and scientific initiative. And I want to speak to each of these and give a brief illustration. So the imminent threat path is exemplified by COVID-19. And here, arguably, the driving force, going back to the framework, is an issue characteristic. And that is that there's a perception of impending harm to privileged population groups in high-income countries. And some of the operative words in this articulation is perception. It could be the case, it need not be the case that there's going to be actual harm, although obviously in COVID-19 there is actual harm. But as long as there's a perception, then this may be enough to give rise to global attention to the issue, so long as it's affecting privileged population groups. One might consider Ebola, for instance, in that regard, which actually did not uh, present a severe threat to privileged population groups in high-income countries, but there was a perception that it did. There are many other uh, issues that may be categorized in terms of imminent threat, in terms of explaining their ascendance, SARS being another one. Another path that we seem to observe is the social movement path, and here the most prominent example is HIV-AIDS. And here the primary driving force seems to be human agency, and especially social and political mobilization connected to a grievance. We can think of some other examples of social movements emerging and being the result of uh, uh, leading to the attention of particular issues. For instance, disability rights, and to some extent, tobacco control. A third path, we can observe is what we call a scientific initiative path. And here, the primary driving force also is connected to human agency, but of a slightly different kind. And that is mobilization and advocacy by experts, scientific communities. And newborn survival shares many features of this kind of mobilization. Newborn survival, as many people know, is a huge issue about 2.5 million babies die globally before the first month of life, reaching one month of life. Prior to uh, 2000, it received virtually no global attention or national attention in, in low-income countries. But over the past two decades, it has come to acquire attention and resources. It's now in the SDGs. And a lot of this had to do with the work and research and advocacy by a network of health 
and health uh, professionals and scientists. Other issues that may resemble this path include neglected tropical diseases and injuries, which still struggles to gain traction, but seems to be being led by many prominent scientists. So what are the differences between these paths? Well, the main difference is what is the primary driver. With imminent threat, it's impending harm to privileged population groups. With social movement, it has to do with civil society, political mobilization. With scientific initiatives, it has to do with the advocacy by experts and scientists. But these paths differ also in the speed of ascent, where imminent threat seemed to move rapidly onto global agendas. Social movements, by contrast, take uh, quite some time. They also differ in the level of conflict. Social movements always have high levels of conflict. By contrast, imminent threat and scientific initiative paths vary in the level of conflict. It may be low, it may be more significant. Rarely is it as high as social movements, though. But I want to emphasize, and this is a critical point, there, there are no pure paths. Any issue seems to be, if it emerges as a global health priority, seems to do so through a conjunction of factors shaped by issue characteristics, by human agency, both of a socio-political and scientific nature, and by structural forces. And just to give an example in these three cases that I've covered, Yes, COVID-19 seems to be driven quite heavily by its lethality, its high transmissibility, but also human agency has mattered. Some countries have put it rapidly on the agenda in a positive and effective way and dealt with this crisis very effectively. For instance, New Zealand, Taiwan, Korea have led, their national leaders have led very effective responses. Other countries have done very poorly in that regard and delayed action, including the United States, the United Kingdom, and even uh, more disturbingly, Brazil, where the President Bolsonaro has denied the severity of the crisis. AIDS. While a dominant element of the AIDS social movement is civil society and political mobilization, there are many other factors that shaped the rise of global attention to AIDS among which was scientific initiative, the discovery uh, by scientists of antiretroviral drugs. And newborn survival too. If a defining feature of newborn survival was an epistemic community, a scientific community, identifying a problem and advocating for attention and developing solutions, this also was shaped by advocacy by parent groups as well. So all these, are multi-causal initiatives. One should never assume there's any one factor that stands behind the rise of attention to a global health issue. So connecting the paths to the framework factors, if, and the, the operative word here is if, because most issues do not receive the attention they deserve, but if it, an issue receives att attention, framework factors may shape the likely path. And we can think about it this way. So is there a perceived immediate threat to a privileged population group? We can think about the framework factors of lethality, of transmissibility of uh, the affected population group. And if there is such a threat, then the issue may ascend through an imminent threat path. But if not, we can then ask, does this issue incite resistance by threatening economic interests like tobacco or alcohol? or widespread social norms. Again, appealing to opposition is one of the framework factors. And if it does, and it ascends, it may ascend through a social movement path. But if it does not incite that kind of opposition, then we can ask about whether there exists a group of experts, scientists, and others who have identified an overlooked harm, speaking then to the composition of the network and actors who uh, are concerned with the issue and they're concerned with its severity. And if that's the case, there's a possibility that the issue may ascend through a scientific initiative path. So let me now conclude with a couple slides 
that speak to priorities for advancing research and practice. And this takes us back to the original questions. First, priorities for advancing research. I think there is a crucial need to develop sharper explanation, sharper theory pertaining to why issues are getting attention or are neglected in global health. We're hoping that the framework we present helps to identify those, but actually research is not sufficiently robust to be able to identify which are central factors and how they interact. I think this forms a huge research agenda for the future, and we wouldn't claim to have yet figured this out. That being said, I think that the punctuated equilibrium theory offers some promising directions for thinking about these issues, and in particular, for thinking about the role of interests and ideas of personal agendas and normative and causal concerns in trying to understand why issues receive attention by examining policy monopolies and images how policy monopolies form and images form and then get challenged. I suspect there's going to be a lot of leverage by looking there. Also, I think a big priority for advancing research is considering how we understand the various paths to ascent. We've offered an initial set of ideas of three paths that we observe. This may not be the best way to conceptualize this. We throw this out there hoping to get people's reactions in terms of thinking about how we understand these paths and what factors may shape them. And then finally, let me turn to priorities for advancing practice and to the, question, the concerns I raised at the beginning. I think some crucial um, priorities for advancing practice are first of all, to find ways to surmount the democratic deficit in global health to redress the power imbalances, the fact that a small number of elite individuals and institutions are heavily shaping global priorities and the voices of those most affected often have little input into these processes. Also, to address a problem that's really become quite marked in the face of the COVID-19 crisis, and that is to enhance the, need, the respect for expertise the scientific expertise that exists. And this must link Southern actors, Northern actors, low-income, high-income actors. The presumption that expertise resides in high-income settings is just does not, um, it, it, it does not stand. And finally, the need to attend to the phenomenon of crowding out. And here, I go back to the observation that with scarce resources, this is a competitive space. And advocates tend to be quite impassioned about uh, their own particular health issues, sometimes to neglecting the fact that their advocacy may be harming other issues in that crowded space. So I would just say there's a need for a kind of Hippocratic health for health advocacy where as advocates rightfully push for their own issue, they should also all, always do so with attention to not having adverse effects on other health issues. So with that, I will leave it and look forward to people's questions. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and ask Yusra to come on. And Yusra is, it looks like we have about 10 to 14 minutes. So Yusra's been monitoring the questions and she's gonna share a few questions. Uh, if we can't get to all of them, I apologize. I do hope you will email me and we'll be happy to respond to those. So Yusra, go ahead. Yeah, great. Thank you, Jeremy. So we've received several um, excellent questions um, so far and I, um, I encourage everybody to continue submitting questions. Um, but as Jeremy indicated at the beginning, he will be available for over email for those questions that we won't be able to get to during the time that we have left. Um, so the first question um, is submitted by uh, Louis Fezzen. Um, the question is, is polio eradication a priority because of funding sources from Gates Foundation or more by initiatives from low and middle income countries? 
Yeah. So that, that's an excellent question that speaks to a number of issues that have we've tried to raise. So is is it is it a function of the actions of elite institutions or a priority of low and middle income countries? Undoubtedly, the answer is it certainly is a priority for the Gates Foundation, or it was until recently, the Gates Foundation seems to be focused on COVID now, uh, as well as a number of other actors, Rotary and other actors, the Global Polio Eradication Initiative. And I would guess that some low and middle income countries prioritize this, and many, many other low and middle income country governments wonder why this has become such a priority and are concerned that with the emphasis on polio eradication, this may be having some detrimental effects in some cases on routine immunization processes and maybe this is not the way to go. So I think your question is a good one and it just speaks to what do we think, the question of what do we think constitutes just agenda setting? Who should be making these decisions as to what should be prioritized and what should not. I don't want to offer a, a specific answer to that, save for the observation that we made that th this is not a democratic system. I wouldn't say it has to be a fully democratic system, but there's a, there's a lack of voice from the actors most affected in the global agenda setting process. And some people point to polio as a case where uh, an example here uh, of that lack of uh, voice coming from um, populations most affected. Great, great, thanks, Jeremy. Um, another question from an anonymous um, submission in this framework, how does, um, in parentheses, active disinformation shape issue ascent? Yes, well, we're, we're seeing this uh, very disturbing phenomenon in the face of COVID-19. I, I can't comment in the past on how active disinformation has shaped ascent. We see um, the anti-vaxxers as one example. Um, growing concern with measles, but we're seeing this quite heavily in the face of COVID-19. And I think with um, the rise of social media, my prediction would be that this misinformation, disinformation is going to become an increasingly worrying phenomenon in global health and one that uh, public health professionals are going to have to confront much more actively. But I should, I should, say that this is not simply a, a concern of civil society and particular actors within civil society. We should be concerned also about our political leaders who are very much part of the active uh, misinformation process, speaking publicly on things they don't know about, de-emphasizing issues that need to be emphasized. So the concern is not simply social media and misinformation among social actors, it's misinformation among politicians and leaders who should, we would hope know better, but don't. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, another question submitted by Sarah Bennett. Um, does your theory help us understand how issues stay on or disappear from the policy agenda? For example, if a vaccine for COVID-19 becomes available to the elite, would we expect to see COVID-19 drop down the agenda? or do issues tend to stick around once they've achieved prioritize, prioritization? So that's a very good question, Sarah. Uh, I've focused, as you'll probably know, more on trying to figure out how they ascend. But you're raising questions about stability and decline. I would add that we also need to think about neglect, why issues never make it, or why they're denied access. Do the factors that I and Yusra have presented adequately explain neglect, denial of access, sustainability on the agenda, or descent? I, I am not sure. I have to think more thoroughly about that. It could be that different arrays of, act, of factors shape different phenomena that we've just described. 
but I think that's a, a huge issue to consider. The one point I would add, though, is that this idea of punctuated equilibrium um, with policy monopolies controlling policy images, then new policy monopolies forming with alternative policy images and no equilibrium ever uh, everlasting. This dynamic, I think, offers promise for explaining stability and change for assent and dissent, perhaps even for denial of agenda uh, access. So in a, in a nutshell, I, I'm not sure, uh, but I think that all these questions are ones we have to continue to investigate. And as I emphasized from the beginning, I actually, people, this, this is a kind of, this question about how issues get attention or are neglected in global health is the kind of question that everybody thinks they know the answer to. And once you jump into it, it's just, it becomes very complex. And I actually, this is an area where I think we know very little. So all this forms a, a, an interesting future research agenda. Okay, Jeremy, and another um, question submitted by uh, Rosemary Morgan. Um, it seems like global health priorities are being shaped by actors such as Bill and Melinda Gates. There have been a lot of conspiracy theories surrounding their involvement. How do you reconcile this in your, in your work? How much of a role do, you, do they have to play and um, should we be worried? Um, this, this seems increasingly important when the United States defunds the WHO and the private actors are increasingly more important. Right, so that's a good question by Rosemary Morgan about the role of individuals in shaping global health agendas. And what, what, I, I, what I wanna emphasize is that, I think th th there's a good bit of evidence to indicate that particular actors like the Gates Foundation, the US government uh, in the past, the World Bank, uh, some of the public-private partnerships like Gavi, the Global Fund, uh, HIV AIDS movements um, and leaders have wielded a great amount of power in the global health agenda setting space. But that's why we have a free, uh, threefold framework of three categories of factors. Human agency seems to be one set of factors and elite, elites like Gates and others, but it's not adequate to provide a comprehensive explanation. And I'll, I'll give you one example. I don't think the rise of COVID-19 has to, as, as, as the attention it's receiving has to do with any single individual or foundation or organization. It also has to do in part with the nature of the issue, the fact that it's rapidly spreading in high income populations, it's lethal, it's highly transmissible, um, quickly transmissible. So it's not just human agency. And even COVID-19 is connected to structural forces, the, the, the phenomenon of globalization that has allowed for the global spread of pathogens. So I think as we develop explanations, um, you're right to ask about and be concerned about the power of particular individuals and organizations. But as a, for a comprehensive theory, we need to connect human agency both among elites as well as social actors like in the AIDS movement, the characteristics of the issue and the global structural forces that shape assent. I think we're going to get um, you know, more comprehensive theories by considering this holistically on those terms. That in, in, in some ways, that's the core idea of what we're trying to get across. It's never any one thing. Okay. Um, and another question, we have four minutes, so we might be able to fit in two, one more okay. question after this. But um, <laughs> um, the next question is submitted by Fong. Um, what do you make of the recent politicization of the WHO? How should we think of the future of the balance of power, as it were, for setting global health priorities? Yeah, that's a very important and thoughtful question. So here we have a case of a uh, a crucial uh, agency v vital to protecting global health that lacks power because it's underfunded. When it does get funding, most of its budget is allocated uh, by its funders for specific causes and is supposed to be able to um, guide countries and ask them 
the international health regulations um, have legal power, um, for instance, uh, and, and states are supposed to follow those. But in this international system, powerful nation states ignore the advice of the WHO, unfortunately, so it doesn't have enforcement power. So this is very tricky because we need the WHO, but in the international system uh, and given the power of particular countries, the WHO lacks the power to shape their behavior. Uh, in the post-COVID era, we absolutely have to figure out a better way to ensure that the WHO stands at the heart of facilitating international cooperation on these kinds of issues. Great, and we have two more minutes, so maybe this will um, be our last question, and um, I apologize, there are many more excellent questions. Um, but this one's submitted by Daniela Rodriguez. She says, um, it sounds like you're suggesting that advocates worry about Pareto efficiency in their advocacy work. For example, what I advocate doesn't harm or crowd out others. But what you've shown in your talk and we see all around us is that loudness is rewarded. So it'd be uh, counterintuitive for advocates to take this approach, especially because it removes the onus from governments to actually find the budgets for all issues to receive the resources they need. Do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, that's a thoughtful question by Daniela. So I, I'm not claiming that I think advocates will suddenly stand back and um, become more reflective and consider how, in some instances, their loud voices may harm other issues that get neglected. Uh, that, that's not just going to happen because someone calls for them to do so. I'm just throwing out the idea that the nature of advocacy, advocacy is such that people quite understandably, I myself do the same, become very passionate about particular issues and then fail to see that as I advocate or as others advocate, this may not be the best way uh, because it may actually cause harm to other issues. So simply by saying that, it's not gonna change the behavior of advocacy groups. But I just hope to throw out the idea that some critical self-reflection is needed. It's not enough to become impassioned about a single issue. One hopefully becomes uh, in, uh, uh, passionate about a broader concerns of social justice and health equity and the wide array of issues that affect that. And while contributing, it's not wrong to contribute to individual is issues. I mean, that's what drives action and I would never want to see that go away. Nevertheless, to be more attentive to take a Hippocratic oath and be attentive to what's going around in, in the space around your advocacy community so that you're not causing harm. Well, thank you so very much, Jeremy and Yusra. Um, you've given us a lot to think about um, uh, today in the context of the pandemic, but way beyond. And we so very much appreciate your being with us here today. Um, being willing to do a Zoom um, uh, Dean's Lecture. And uh, we look forward to um, uh, future conversations. And as Jeremy mentioned, um, if you, your question was not answered or if you have more questions, um, he would love to hear from you. So uh, please reach out. Um, Jeremy is our first Zoom Dean's Lecturer, but he will not be the last. We have at least two others that are scheduled for Zoom presentation. Um, on June uh, 4th, Sean Briggy is going to um, present to us, and then on June 30th, uh, Janice Bowie. So we'll be getting notices out um, on those two events uh, to you very shortly, and we hope to see you at those lectures as well. But thanks again, everyone, for joining us. Um, stay well and enjoy the rest of the day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.